Hello, my name is Marie Lamench. Welcome to the Coronavirus Diaries. Today I'm very happy to talk to Elise Thomas. She's a researcher at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, she focuses on cybersecurity, information security, uh, humanitarian and human rights issues and international relations. Elise, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, can you perhaps just briefly talk about your work in general and the mission of the um, Australian Strategic uh, Policy Institute? Sure. Um, so ASPE is a defence and security think tank and I work for the International Cyber Policy Centre um, and we work across an uh, ever-expanding range of issues. Um, um, so we particularly focus on sort of issues related to um, China and information warfare, um, disinformation influence operations it tends to be the area that, that I've been working on recently. Um, but I also look at um, conspiracy theories, far right. So it's sort of a... a um, Grab bag of interesting topics, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you recently wrote um, several articles on China's attempt to shift the narrative around its handling of the coronavirus. Um, and the regime now claims basically that China is winning the war against the virus and that authoritarian governments or more centralized governments are better able to actually handle the pandemic uh, compared to um, democratic or more open societies. Um, first, how, how does this narrative fit into uh, China's attempts over the past few years to be a lot more powerful on the international stage and to perhaps spread its model of governance elsewhere on, around the globe? Um, well, I, I think the, the thing to say at the outset is that this doesn't fit into China's long-term plans. Like, this is a reactive process, the same, the same way the rest of the world didn't see this coming and is having to react on their feet, so is China, and so are the people who are in charge of pushing that international narrative from China. Um, so what we're seeing, I think, is in some ways kind of a crisis PR response. People have come up with an idea and they're pushing it on the fly. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, over time we see that approach moderate or sort of change a little bit. Um, and so, for example, when we saw the, uh, the Chinese diplomat Zhao Lijong, when we saw him um, retweet and amplify a, a conspiracy theory about, about the origins of the COVID-19 virus, um, I think we could consider that kind of a, like a trial balloon, um, like sort of then testing out an idea and just seeing if it got traction and seeing if it worked, and it, it seems like it has. Um, so we can probably expect more along those lines, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if they try out a few different things, um, as any good crisis manager would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um Actually, now that you mentioned the, the conspiracy, I think it was found on the Canadian website? Yeah, um, so it's this uh, website called the Centre for, um, hang on, let, let me just double check the full title. It's um, called Global Research. Hang, hang on, maybe you can just edit this bit a little bit. I'll just check. It's like Centre for Research and Globalisation. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I'll start again. Um, so it's a Canadian website called the Centre for Research on Globalisation, which has um, for a long time been um, charged with pushing uh, pro-Kremlin narratives um, and sort of has had a, a symbiotic relationship with the, with the Russian state-linked media. Um, and it's very interesting now to see that same sort of um, symbiotic dynamic, that, that mutually beneficial pushing of one another's narratives appearing with the, the Chinese state-linked voices, um, including uh, diplomats on Twitter, but also including um, Chinese state media. Okay, and I, I, we've seen this collaboration between, I mean, it's not a, a, an obvious uh, collaborations between kind of French media and, and state. Um, we've seen this, I mean, we, we spoke to other researchers last week who, who are watching the situation in Russia and they say that we have the same situation over there too, where you have this like semi-collaboration between French media and, and state controlled um, media or, or policy makers. So yeah, and I, I think one of the really, in, sorry. It's the same thing in, you're seeing in, in China? Uh, yeah, well, not uh, like I'm. I'm not looking at the media in China, um, but was, what, what we're seeing is sort of the international media sphere. Yeah, we're seeing that, and I, I think it's really interesting also that we're seeing it come out. Not just not just um, you know a relationship between Chinese state media and Western fringe media, but 
the same fringe media outlets. I think that's really interesting um, in that sort of, you know, they're not sort of forming as yet. They're not forming like collaborations with new fringe media. It's the same fringe media outlets. Um, and I, I think that is really interesting. Um, and, you know, we could, we could, I think there'd be, a, there'd be room for research about sort of specifically why it's the same fringe media, whether it's because they already have, um, you know, their different dissemination channels set up because they already sort of, understand maybe i have like an implicit understanding of how those kind of relationships are mutually beneficial so for example when um Jean, when he retweeted that article he would have given an incredible boost to their traffic like it's a, this is a you know a hugely mutually beneficial relationship to them um and you can, i think you can see that because they sort of almost immediately went out and wrote like three other articles about the fact that he'd retweeted their article um so yeah, I, I think it, it is a really interesting dynamic um, and I suspect it's going to be with us for quite a long time into the future. Yeah. yeah. And now that China is kind of selling this or trying out this narrative that China is winning the war over the virus, do you think that we might or some people might come out of this pandemic thinking actually China and its um, governance model or authoritarian model you know, might work better and perhaps we should look at China's uh, governance model and, and adopt it? Because I've seen the debate a little bit in the media, even the New York Times talking about uh, is our authoritarian states better fit to actually control such a crisis? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that's possible. I think we need to distinguish between sort of, um, I think we not, need to not equate the specific model of authoritarianism in China with authoritarianism as a whole. I think we're going to see a number of authorities, in fact, we sadly are already seeing a number of authoritarian states really failing to, to contain this virus. You look at Iran, um, Venezuela is likely to be in significant trouble. Um, Turkmenistan has just banned the word coronavirus. Um, so I, I guess we'll see how that works out for them, but I suspect it's not going to go well. Yeah, um, there is things in, in, in Chechnya as well, where the leader said basically who, anybody who's, um, um, you know, talking about it might be you know killed or something like that it's it's very scary sometimes mm, and sort of various various states around the world um in africa in sort of parts of, of south america where you sort of um you know they they have very low uh, case counts at the moment um and you suspect that's because the government is not taking the lead in trying to you know do widespread testing um so i actually suspect we are going to see a number of authority the authoritarian model as a whole i don't think will be bolstered by this but i do think it's quite possible that um the the sort of the pro-china voices will be very successful in in promoting china's apparent success mm -hmm. in bidding this virus. So i think although having said that i also think it's probably too soon to declare the war one even in china um we'll see what happens now as they sort of gradually start to release restrictions um, and you know, you, you hope it goes well. Um, yeah. Um, I know at the, uh, at the beginning of the crisis, China kind of denied or silenced voices who claimed that the coronavirus was spreading across the country. Can you cite a few examples of perhaps the very kind of authoritarian, um, measures imposed by by the chinese uh, but on, on chinese citizens both in terms of like the technology used and then silencing um the media and journalists um it's not really my area so i i wouldn't sort of want to um i probably wouldn't want to be recorded talking about it okay yeah, I'm sorry. um do you, do you think I, I tend to look at sort of the, the kind of the international media space i don't tend to look at so much china's domestic media space i have some colleagues who do um, mm -hmm. I can put you in touch with them if you're interested, um, but that's not sort of what I look at. Okay. Um, we're seeing really a war of kind of narrative between China and, and, and the US. Um, for example, Donald Trump has called it the Wuhan virus. And meanwhile, you know, obviously the, there's a conspiracy theory that um, the U.S. actually perhaps created the virus, or that it emerged there. How does it fit? Can you perhaps say a bit more about how it fits into the kind of competition between the U.S. and China that we have seen over the past few kind of years? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think the interesting thing about this crisis is 
it was coming into what was already a very geopolitically charged situation. Um, and it's being interpreted in ways that confirm, it's being interpreted by, by a range of actors in ways that sort of confirm their pre-existing biases, their pre-existing conditions. Um, so I've been doing a, just as a, as a tangent, I've been doing a bit of research recently on sort of how the, the far right is adapting to coronavirus. Um, and it's really interesting to see the ways in which the different strands of the far right are adapting it and uh, interpreting it in relation to their own pre-existing biases. So white supremacists see it as an attack on the white race, you know, um, these sort of accelerationists, like the doomsday preppers, preppers kind of see it as vindication. We were right all along. Um, and I think uh, we're seeing something similar happen on the international stage. Um, so we're seeing, you know, the, the Trump administration come out and make some, you know, really unfortunate remarks um, in which make it very clear that they are interpreting this crisis in the context of the broader geopolitical context um, and con competition between uh, China and the US. Um, and I and obviously China is responding. Um, and I mean, it's 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 uh, it's difficult to take take sides here because everybody is behaving badly. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it might? Uh, the virus is exacerbating these exist these problems that you know or fringe groups or extremist groups that actually existed before do you think the virus is or the pandemic and the way they kind of use it is is actually ex exacerbating existing problems absolutely yeah 100 percent um we're, i'm actually doing a, a podcast later today for the ASCII podcast about sort of um how uh extremist groups are likely to use this crisis for recruiting mm -hmm. because it um you know the one of the you know, the, the demographic who is most at risk for being recruited into extremist groups are, of course, um, at least from my perspective, because I look at sort of online radicalization. It's um, people who are isolated, angry and spending a lot of time on the Internet. And mm -hmm. we've just created hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people who fit into that bucket. Um, so it's a huge issue. Yeah. And people are spending a lot of time at home on their computers these days. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them will have just lost their jobs. A lot of them, mm -hmm. um, you know, are facing real um, economic hardship. I, I think one of the, you know, the mm, one of the troublesome things about some of the like the discourse that is coming out around sort of um, this is quite off topic from the question you asked. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I, it's one of the, the troubling things about the discourse, um, you know, you sort of have, and actually, no, this does link back in, because one of one of the lines that um, uh, we've seen pro-China voices trying to push on Twitter um, is that the US is looking after companies, not people, and that the US doesn't care about its people, it only cares about sort of its economic situation. Um, and we're seeing that come from pro-China voices, but we're also seeing that come from sort of um, voices in the West, um, who are sort of saying leaders are paying too much attention to the economic situation and not um, focusing enough on, on the health situation. And I think there's, there's some merit to that, but I think we have to consider also that the economic situation is a health situation. Like it, it is uh, pushing people into poverty is going to have huge impacts on their health. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see suicides. We're going to see domestic violence go through the roof. Um, this, is, this is a huge, uh, there is, you know, this is a really hard situation with real human suffering on either side. Um, Sorry, I, that was way off topic. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, because we're looking at various uh, countries and various situations, including right-wing extremism and how they, uh, I mean, just this, uh, earlier today, we spoke to someone who is looking at the case of Hungary, uh, mm. where um, the democratic decline has worsened over the past few years, and now um, Viktor Orban is actually using this crisis to actually crack down on human rights even more. So those yeah. are the situations that we're seeing around the globe. And obviously the e economic uncertainty is really, you know, playing obviously into people's fears. Yeah, and, and sort of, and that, I, coming back to your question about authoritarianism, I think that is the real concern. I don't think it's so much that people will look at the Chinese model and say, look, that works so great, let's implement it here, because um, it, it, it is really hard to implement that kind of a model. It's it just not going to work in a lot of countries. But I think what we will see is we will see authoritarian governments using this crisis as as an opportunity, like which they can exploit to um, further expand their controls, to um, you know crack down, to extend their time in office. Um, so I think that is the real concern. I, I do think we'll see democratic backsliding as, as a result of this, not because people are inspired by China necessarily, but because they, they see an opportunity. Um, how do you think, um, perhaps, if you, how, how Twitter or Facebook or, the, or these like, tech giants, how should they, do you think this, should they kind of handle 
conspiracy theories, especially spread by policymakers and diplomats on their platforms. We've just seen Twitter, both Twitter and Facebook, um, remove two posts by Jair Bolsonaro, for example, in in Brazil, they removed those uh, messages. Should something similar be done with perhaps Chinese policymakers, or how should how should these tech companies, do you think, handle this? Um, well, I don't. I the, the the social media platforms are in a terrifically difficult position, um, and so far they've actually, you know, that obviously the the ways in which they've moderated the crisis haven't been perfect but i think they do deserve credit for the um really unprecedented level of effort that they are taking um in this crisis um and everybody is responding so quickly um i think we have to um you know every response is going to be flawed there will be mistakes but i think they deserve full credit for for the efforts that they're making um on the question of whether or not um, they should uh flag or take down or block leaders who are spreading disinformation that's incredibly tricky, not least because the US president does it on an almost daily basis. Um, and that would have significant ramifications. And I think what they I think whatever they have to do has to be consistent across countries. So it can't be something that, you know, we have seen calls to sort of kick Chinese diplomats off Twitter. I think that's completely unacceptable unless you kick all diplomats off Twitter. We can't have sort of a, an approach from these platforms with signals singles out specific countries. Um, so I, I guess my thinking around that would be um, the ways to handle a uh, tweets from leaders um, spreading disinformation would be maybe to leave the tweets up, but to mark them in some way as being uh, misleading or false. Um, and my, my thinking for leaving them up is that I, I think people have a right to know if their leader is feeding them garbage. Um, yeah. if, uh, you, know, if they, you don't want uh, Twitter or Facebook to be taking down the garbage that certain leaders may be spewing out um, and presenting a inadvertently presenting an image of that leader as a as you know a more sanitized and sane person than perhaps they are mm -hmm. um so i think people have a right to know if if their leader is trying to tell them that but they should also have a right to know if it is misleading so that would be the approach that i would suggest um mm -hmm. but i'm sure a great deal of thinking is already going into this behind the scenes at facebook and twitter and it wouldn't surprise me um i, I actually was quite surprised that they took that action against bolsonaro yeah. because it is a really unusual step for them um and i suspect um we, we may see some more new things over mm -hmm. the next coming months to deal yeah. with the situation one last question perhaps about um technology since you, you you do a lot of research on that um we've seen a lot of new kind of technologies emerge around you know trying to monitor the virus or control it um, you know, it, it's, it's various apps on phones or facial recognition or, or drones, but there is obviously no regulation at the moment. So how should we find the right balance between this obviously health concern and then regulating um, the, the, the technology in order to still protect the privacy of citizens? I mean, there, there are, I mean, so this is this is one of those things which is going to vary from country to country. There are regulations around some of these technologies. Some of these technologies would already be covered by existing data protection. Um, having said that, uh, regulation is only as good as enforcement. And so if there is no one in the wake of this crisis to look back at some of the steps that were taken by authorities and say, actually, you know what, that was illegal and we're going to take you to court over it. If there's no one who's willing or able to do that, then, you know, it's, 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 only, it's only words on paper. Um, so that's, I, I guess, part of it. Um, for the, I guess, the new technologies and also for the technologies which are being implemented under sort of um, emergency powers that various countries have enacted, um, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to say that it isn't necessary to, to do some level of expanded data collection right now. I personally, um, even as someone who is a, you know, a strong advocate for privacy, I think it is necessary right now to an extent, um, but it is also crucial that once we get out of this crisis, those um, additional surveillance methods are rolled back and that's the real concern um, particularly because this is the kind of crisis which isn't likely to have a definitive end um, in that sort of there'll be there'll be a period where cases are dropping and like we, we think there are less we think there are less we think there are less but um, it would be very easy to say but we need to keep watching for another six months to see if any come back and then at the end of six months you'd say well maybe we'll watch for another six months just to be really really sure um, and so it, you, you can see the way that it might be sort of spun out 
Um, the other concern, of course, is that it would be used for purposes other than health surveillance. Um, so that it might be used, for example, we were talking about extremism earlier, there, there would be a temptation to use it for counter-terrorism, counter-extremism in, in democratic states. Um, there obviously would be um, pr probably more than a temptation to use it in authoritarian states for, for other methods. Um, in Russia, they've been using the, uh, there, there was a facial recognition system that was recently turned on in Moscow and yeah. they've been using Facial recognition system as part of their um, response to coronavirus to sort of see mm -hmm. violating quarantine or violating self isolation orders. Um, but obviously, that is going to be used for a range of other purposes in the future. Um, so yeah, I, I do think the the net effect of the COVID nineteen crisis on democracy, on human rights, um, on sort of the the um, eternal battle between sort of security and privacy and surveillance, um, mm -hmm. probably likely to be negative. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Elise. Um, thank you so much for your work and we'll continue to follow it.